pioneering has its has its joys and sorrows. You know, I was seven or eight years old when this all started. All I know is I got caught up in and just absolutely fascinated by the combination of music and electronics. It was unbelievable. And that's what made a synthesizer so phenomenal. It was evil. The enthusiasm. It was infinite. I mean, it was in between, in between the sounds that you could do. Size your hands and give a musical interest. It just it, back in those days, it was like magic. But it was unrequited law. But it was unrequited law. That the 70s and early 80s were were just the wild west of uh, electronic instruments. Everybody was so excited about it. It was a great time. It was an exciting time. Artists used it as each new instrument came out. There was something new on it. It was a new feature. There was something that. Well, like, Yeah, so it, it's witnessing your dream. It, it's you know, um, here it is. It's manifested. It's manifested. Yeah. Because it, it was actually a, the evolution of musical instrument, a real seminal period, electronic kind of the, um, the very beginning. This is Electromotive, the story of art instruments. Alan Robert Perlman was born in New York in 1925. His father was an electromechanical designer who created projectors for movie theatres, and Alan's own interest in electronics began at a very young age. And my grandmother used to tell me stories about my father and his brother when they were little kids, and one of the favorites was that he took apart a radio. Um, and then he ran away from home because he was afraid he was gonna get in trouble. <laughs> He did a lot of that. He did a lot of taking things apart. I think he went to a, an a uncle or a cousin's house. Um, but he, he managed to put it all back together. Um, and then my, my grandmother realized that she had a force on her hands. Um, he was four. Music also became a part of Alan's life early on as he started piano lessons at the age of six. Whilst at high school, Alan's then piano teacher invited a lecturer from Yale to give a demonstration to her pupils on acoustics. At that time, I uh, knew nothing about timbres and all that sort of thing, but uh, he uh, played some recordings and uh, illustrated uh, with some uh, examples what a distinguishing uh, timbre might be. Sort of got the idea that maybe I'd like to work in, in uh, doing something about that. After high school and a stint serving in the military, Alan attended Worcester Polytechnic Institute, graduating in 1948. It was here that he got his first recognition for his engineering talents. Uh, I decided to do a little study uh, myself. I guess it's now called a, uh, an envelope follower, where you uh, play an instrument, process the sound uh, electrically, and you come up with an envelope that you can put in, to another instrument. And it worked pretty well. Not only uh, well, but they asked me to present a paper at a student conference, and I did, and I was very much surprised to win a uh, prize. <laughs> Uh, a certificate or something like that, but uh, that really got me uh, interested. Alan's earliest professional work included designing a radiation detector with six decades of logarithmic response. He also set up the Nexus Research Laboratory, which even included work for NASA and George A. Philbrick designing op amps. At home, one of the things that um, is visit vivid in my memory is having an oscilloscope in the basement. And I found it fascinating. I love to look at that. It was really interesting. And then upstairs we had a music room, um, and this is sort of indicative of, of my father's taste. So there's a baby grand, which I'm sort of sitting at now. That was my parents um, that I have here. And wall, a wall or two of records and a clavichord that my father and I built. He remade one with a kit when I was six and I helped him out. I pretended to help him out. By the late 60s, Alan had registered patents for logarithmic and exponential circuits, and with an eye on the new synthesizers being built by Moog and Buchla, and inspired by the release of Wendy Carlos Switched on Bark, Alan began to consider whether his discoveries had potential for musical application. Big problems that the Moog synthesizer and the Buchla synthesizer had is that they were not very temperature stable. The, the temperature would change and they go out of tune. I thought about it a little bit, so maybe this thing that I had got a patent on is usable in something like that turned out to be, it was very usable. As a matter of fact, I guess it's, it's sort of established a standard. 
If it hadn't been for the fact that I had a job with a company making radiation detector equipment, I probably wouldn't have gotten into electronic music. Alan subsequently sold Nexus to Teledyne and in his mid-40s formed a music company and set up in a humble building on Kenneth Street, Newton Highlands, Massachusetts. Which is a kind of a little crummy warehousey building on a dirt road, which horrified my mother. So much mud uh, to go into the, the place was, you know, you really ruined all your shoes. So it was yeah. just... Uh, he had been a president of this company. It was a you know, big fancy office and all that and next thing we know he's working in uh, you know basically cinder block and cement floor. One of the uh, principal uh, founders was uh, actually, actually a law firm at that time it was Pollock, O'Connor and Jacobs. Lois was a uh, graduate of Yale University and uh, as an early Yale alumnus he would get the publications and one uh, fine day, he came to me and said, well, here's a, uh, an alumni ma magazine over there, and there's some articles about uh, various people, and one of these people happens to be this guy, David Friend, who was in charge of the electronic music lab over there at uh, Yale University. He said, you might want to talk to him. I said, okay. I went to uh, Yale as an undergraduate, and I ma had a double major in engineering and music. And to earn some extra money, I worked building equipment for the Yale Electronic Music Studio. And uh, I, I really kind of built the whole thing from scratch. And uh, I had moved on to Princeton to do graduate work in engineering. And one day I get a call from this lawyer in Boston who said he had a client who wanted to start a synthesizer company. And he had read about me and was interested in talking. So I flew up to Boston and uh, you know, Al drove me over to this little garage kind of plant that we had in uh, in Newton and uh, told me about his plans, showed me his prototype, some of the things he was working on, and uh, very shortly thereafter I left graduate school and moved to Boston to join Al in founding ARP or Donus at that time. The band of Tonus staff also included Manny Mandel, Dick Stearns, Ken McNeil, Margaret Shepard and Buena Perlman. One of the other key people brought on board was engineer Dennis P. Collin. One of the specific modules Dennis worked on was the 1047 multi-mode filter and he subsequently published a paper on it. David Friend joined them shortly after. And, uh, and in fact some of the modules for the ARC 2500 grew out of the work I had done at Yale. Um, because I had been designing and building equipment for the Yale Electronic Music Studio. And uh, so I quickly set about sort of building, uh, designing and building a few of the modules for the 2500. Um, Al was a really great analog engineer and uh, his biggest contribution, I think, from an engineering standpoint was understanding how to make uh, voltage controlled devices and filters and, and oscillators that were stable with respect to temperature. One of the tricks that Al invented was um, if you have two matched transistors that you want to use for compensating for temperature, in order to get the junctions of the transistors close as, as close together as possible, you'd actually take the transistor on a piece of sandpaper and grind it down until the epoxy was almost down to where the junction was. And then you'd glue the two transistors together. <laughs> And so, you know, most people didn't think of things like that. Moving with impressive speed, Tonus unveiled their debut instrument just one year later at the annual Audio Engineering Society show in October of 1970. The first version is referred to in documentation as either the Series 2000 Modular Studio Synthesizer or simply the ARP synthesizer. They followed numerous configurations and cabinet sizes. These systems are collectively referred to as the ARP 2500, although that name doesn't actually appear anywhere on the earlier models and came slightly later. 
And as the systems are modular and custom arrangements could be assembled, there isn't one standard instrument that is the ARP 2500. Hence it's somewhat more of an umbrella term for a family of synthesizers that share common electronics. These systems are all distinct in that they used a matrix switching panel instead of patch cords. Well, the, the patch cords were, were widely cited as a, as a real pain in the neck. Um, and, you know, Al identified that as a problem very early on, and we were looking for a better solution. It, it, it's clean, and when you got good at it, you could visualize the patch very easily. It wasn't like, you know, this maze of patch cords where you can, can't figure out what's connected to what. Um, the, the matrix switch thing was, was quite visual, and so even a fairly complicated patch, you could run your eye around it very quickly, see what's connected to what. In this fledgling market, using cutting-edge technology, the first synths were both expensive and highly specialist. The system prices ranged between $4,000 and $20,000, which converts to around $25,000 to $130,000 in today's money, and the average musician was unlikely to know how to operate one either. So it's not surprising that few ARP 2500 variants were ever built, but the 2500 had an impact far greater than its numbers. I think there were four or five of us at the end of building the first 2500 and I remember we all sat around and looked at it and said wow this is great and then somebody says now who's going to sell it and uh, I was elected having been kind of the least nerdy of the of the five people that were there so I put the thing in a station wagon and drove it around and sold one to Brown University and then sold one to my old alma mater, Yale University, and then sold one to my wife's university, Sarah Lawrence College down in New York. And that's how it began. And that's also kind of the end of my career as an engineer because I went on from there to really just getting sucked into sales and marketing and eventually ending up as, as president of ARP. As the technology was so new, the adoption of synthesizers by mainstream musicians took a couple of years. The, the first round of them pretty much all went to universities. And the second round started to get into, you know, the jingle business and, and you know, people doing commercial stuff in, in home studios. And then, you know, and then they really started to, to catch on in uh, recording studios that bands were using, you know, and that was that was precipitated by some of the early rock and rollers who, you know, bought them for their home use and the, the sound started to appear on records and then that started to create demand in the, in the pop music business. Pete Townsend was an early adopter of synthesizers who'd previously used an EMS VCS3. He later upgraded to an ARP 2500 and used it prominently on the Who's Next, Quadrophenia and Tommy albums amongst others, sparking a long relationship between himself and ARP. In fact, Pete still has his 2500 in his studio to this very day. Jimmy Page, George Harrison and Jean-Michel Jarre also purchased 2500s, as did Vangelis, who later used it on the Chariots of Fire soundtrack. The opening synthesized arrangement to Elton John's Funeral for a Friend was also performed and recorded on a 2500 by David Henschel. 
Elsewhere, French contemporary composer Eliane Radig used a 2500 for decades in her electronic works, finding ongoing inspiration from the instrument. Several years after its release, the 2500 even made a physical appearance in Steven Spielberg's Close Encounters of the Third Kind, where it was used to communicate with the aliens. Then service manager and later vice president of engineering Phil Dodds even appeared in the film as the character operating it, after Spielberg thought he looked the part. Um, the original uh, service manager, I stole him from one of the dealers out of Washington, uh, Clark Ferguson. Uh, and Phil was his assistant service manager from that dealer in Washington. And I stole him <laughs> and, and brought him on board. And uh, we finally shipped him uh, something over there. And uh, about a week later, <clears throat> we got a uh, call from them. And they said, gee, uh, we uh, really don't know how to cope with it. Uh, we, we don't know how to unpack it, set it up, and everything like that. And uh, the instruction manuals are good, but who's got time to for all that? Can you lend us somebody that will help? Phil asked, well, can I do it out? I said, well, reluctantly, I said, yeah, okay. Uh, how long was it taking me? He said, a few days, maybe a week. Okay. And about a couple hours before I was to make my way to the airport, everything's done, I had to do the checkout with the director and saying, are you okay with this? And so um, Steven Spielberg and John Williams show up. And... Uh, they say, hey, that looks pretty cool. And they say, well, can, you, can you give me a demo? Uh, and see, yeah, can you make a trumpet sound? Can you give this and such sound? So I say, oh, yeah, sure. How about that? Oh, yeah, that's good. How, can you do a, kind of a cello-ish sound? You know? <laughs> yeah, that's cool. And this went on for a while. And then uh, Spielberg and Williams came up to the console. And I remember Spielberg saying, oh, that's really interesting. Uh, I'm just going to ask, do you have any acting experience? <laughs> And I had the most fun. I, I got the thing set up, and then when the set was closed uh, for the night, they hadn't started shooting yet. I had about three hours to myself in the dirigible hangar where I cranked up that machine. <laughs> and I had every sequencer going, and, and the sound is echoing and recoiling from the ceilings. And I'm to I was told the next day that uh, uh, they could hear it a mile away, because it apparently reflected up. And they were going, what on earth? <laughs> The mineral oil that they burned for the clouds coming in, it got all over the 2500. It was ruined it. It was a nightmare. I've never seen a greasy synthesizer before, but when this thing came back, it was completely coated with oil. It was gross. I mean, we basically threw it away. Yeah, when a, one of the things I learned, when a movie finishes, the production company folds up shop and goes away, and there's, there's not even anybody to sue. They have all of these, you know, very complex legal entities set up and so all of the promises and obligations that they make are worthless trash the synthesizer and they stole my EP of customer support <laughs> and all we had to show for it was a good story <laughs> they would for me was excellent i don't remember the exact numbers but it was enough to to handily put down a uh, down payment on, on a really nice house in, in needham for me at that period it was huge the 2500 was also used by Jerry Goldsmith in the Logan's Run score and further establishing ARP's connection to science fiction imagery, it was used on Jeff Wayne's musical version of The War of the Worlds. Five decades later, the 2500 is a prized possession that still inspires artists, composers and producers who own them, such as Aphex Twin, John Frusciante and David Barron, whose system this is. In 1971, ARP followed on from the 2500 with their next flagship instrument, the 2600. And so we thought, well, you know, if a university can spend $25,000, what about a public school, you know, like a high school, 
if they could if we could make it for twenty five hundred dollars instead of twenty five thousand dollars maybe they would start buying it and at the same time we also said look if Pete Townsend can shell out twenty five or thirty thousand dollars for a twenty five hundred why can't the average high school rock band shell out a tenth of that the result was a smaller, semi-modular monosynth that was normaled with a hardwired signal path that could be defeated with patch cables, rather than the pin matrix of the 2500. Hardwired in a sense that if you didn't put any patch cords onto the thing, it would, you'd still be able to use it as an instrument. And there were predetermined uh, functions as though there were internal patch cords. The concept and design of the 2600 was the work of Alan Perlman, David Friend, Dennis Collin, and Jeremy Hill. And uh, so when we got the uh, 2600, the first 2600 built, um, I put it under my arm and took it to New York City and made what was probably the first sales call of a synthesizer manufacturer on a retail music store. So I walked into Manny's Music, which was a big music store in 40. 6th Street or 48th Street in New York City and they took one look at all the knobs and buttons and everything else and basically deposit, deposited me back out on the street with my 2600 and so I walked literally right next door to Sam Ash Music and tried again and they said well we'll take it on consignment how about that and it sold like three days later and so they called up and ordered another one and this time they had to pay for it and about a week later, I got a call from Manny's apologizing for throwing me out on the street and said they wanted one too. And uh, so that, that was the beginning of the ARP dealer network. There were at least nine iterations of the 2600 over a 10-year period, and you'd have to be a monotonous nerd to go through them all. So here we go. The first model was the 2600, nicknamed the Blue Marvin after their then chief financial officer, Marvin Cohen. Rarest of all, only two dozen or so were made. One person to get their hands on a Blue Marvin was composer and performer Don Muro. I went up to uh, visit them, and they were in that big garage. Dave Friend and um, Alan Perlman, that's where I met them for the first time. And then there were people in the back on stools with soldering guns, basically uh, putting instruments together, putting 2,500 modules, I guess, together. And that's what they had available to show me, and you know, it was like $7,000. It blew me away, but I, I couldn't afford it. But Dave Friend said to me, well, let's keep in touch because um, we have some things coming down the pike, and uh, I think you'd be interested in them. I got a call later on from, I think it was Dave, saying that uh, Walter Sear, who was already selling Moogs in New York City, he said to go in and check this out. So I went into Sear Sound in New York, and there was uh, 2600. And I played with it, and I said... I've got to have one of these. And I basically called Dave Friend up and begged him. I said, you know, I really can't see life without this. And he said, well, we do have some early models, quasi-prototypes, that we're just going to get rid of. We ha I have one left if you're interested in it. He said, you know, it's, it's, kind of, it's a metal case. I said, I don't care if it's a rubber case. You know, I'll take it. So for $1,200, I got a blue Marvin 2600. And that arrived in July, and I basically lived with it for a couple of months and did my first demonstration performance with it in the fall of 1971. Don also experimented with recording the 2600 for the first time later that same year. And as well as recording, Don took this new technology out in public for performances and workshops, which received mixed reactions. I remember doing a showcase once, talking about electronic music, at a major music education university. I'm not going to mention names because bygones be bygones. One professor had his back to me the entire presentation. 
they were sitting at round tables. You know, it was after dinner, it was a lecture demonstration on the new world of electronic music. This one elderly gentleman sat with his back to me, sipping his coffee the entire hour. But it was, it was never, I guess they saw it as a kind of us versus them, but it's, it's all music. And it was just too big a step, I think, for a lot of people who just grew up in a strictly acoustic, classical world. So I understand that. But the early days were pretty hairy at a couple of spots. Take a look around. We won. <laughs> the original 2600 model was followed by the 2600C, also known as the Grey Meanie, shortly after. Again, only a few dozen of these were made. Still, in 1971 came the 2600P version 1, which is the first to be housed in a more robust portable case with a handle. This model used different oscillators to the two previous models, and from version 1 to version 4 of the 2600P in 1974, there were two further changes to the VCOs. Version 4 also had the ability to be played duophonically via its 3620 keyboard. This was thanks to the implementation of a design used in other synths such as the EML Electrocomp that was adapted for the 2600 by a young engineer and then ARP dealer called Tom Oberheim. Wonder what happened to him? The music you're hearing now was created by Lisa Belladonna on a 2600P version 2. It was during the run of the 2600Ps that the company name was changed from Tonus to ARP. Al used to sign his schematic diagrams, ARP. And, you know, we were sitting around trying to think up a new name for the business, and somebody looks down at this schematic diagram and says, how about ARP? <laughs> That's how it happened. In some languages, like ARPA is, is a harp in Italian, and I think ARP in French is something like a true sum. It's musical sounding. I remember that vividly. I do remember that vividly. There was a, you know, a lot of re redesign. Margaret Shepard, David Friend's wife, was responsible for a lot of the artwork. And I used to really enjoy the artwork that came with the, the collateral, the print collateral and things like that, um, the cartoons that she made. And, and she was actually a big influence on me as far as wanting to be a graphic designer. In fact, the original ARP G-Clef logo with power cord had also been designed by Margaret. It was then later adapted by David Frederick into the final version. But back to the 2600, in 1975 came the 2601 version 1, which had some improvements to front end components, but was otherwise very similar to the 2600P version 4. And in 1977 came the 2601 version 2, which was significantly different and not just because of a new color scheme. After conversations with Moog over their patented ladder filter, ARP had to abandon their 4012 design and introduce a new 4072 from this model onwards. Despite some myths about a lawsuit between Moog and ARP, there wasn't one. And then finally came the 2601 version 3 in 1980 of which very few were made. Across its various incarnations, somewhere between 2 and 3000 2600s were produced, which is quite a substantial number for an electronic instrument from the early 70s. Whether you're into synthesizers or not, you've almost certainly heard it because sound designer Ben Burt used his to create the voice of R2-D2. It was also used again by Pete Townsend as well as Jean-Michel Jarre, Joy Division, Weather Report, Depeche Mode, Stevie Wonder, Vince Clark, Tony Banks, Edgar Winter and Rick Wakeman amongst many others. <laughs>
Whilst the early synthesizers were bought by universities, music labs and the rich and famous, art were quick to realise the need to create simpler and more portable instruments for use by the average musician. The first instrument to that effect was the ARP Soloist, which was a single oscillator preset based monosynth with a few performance controls. Interestingly, the Soloist had a signable aftertouch with threshold and sensitivity settings on the back of the instrument. And first of all, the first Soloist was put together with chewing gum and bailing wire, basically. It was, it was, it was, the, it was a service nightmare. But uh, it, it, it was a precursor to a later attempt, which was the Pro Soloist. Uh, where that was properly designed. The original soloist was designed primarily by Dennis Collin and British native Jeremy Hill, who was one of the earliest engineers ARP hired. A subsequent refined version, the pro soloist, would be his doing. Prior to ARP, Jeremy had taken a pre-university course at Associated Electrical Industries, or AEI, in Manchester in the north of England, before completing a degree in electrical engineering at the University of Bristol. Returning to AEI, Jeremy was transferred to their facility in New Parks, Leicester. So I was working on things associated with military radar, specifically very high voltage um, power supplies that um, would uh, go to a high voltage somewhere between 600 and 900 volts and stay there very precisely for a certain period of time and then randomly change to another level, stay there, randomly change to another. And it was for um, anti-interference, uh, anti-jamming radar so that you're constantly changing the frequency of the radar, so you couldn't track it. So it's like sampling hole. With exactly, sampling yeah. hole with super high voltage is exactly what it was. Yeah. At this time, due to the Vietnam War, American companies were recruiting British engineers through an initiative called the Manpower Register. Jeremy went for an interview and was offered jobs with two U.S. companies. One of them was Avco, and so Jeremy and his family moved to Cincinnati, Ohio, to join them. He continued to work on military technology such as transceivers, manpack radios and again, anti-jamming systems for radar. I was into military electronics as you're hearing and I didn't really like the idea of being into military electronics. I wanted to do something that I thought was more um, um, useful to the world. My wife was in a, a church choir and she had a choir director who was into electronic music and he told me about ARP and that's what led me to, out of the blue, call up and say, I might be interested in doing something with you if you're interested in doing something for me. After a callback, Jeremy flew up to Boston for an interview and was met at the airport by Alan Perlman and David Friend. Al had this little sob and David was in the back seat. I go in the front seat next to Al. The first thing I do is I sit there and the engine starts revving very high. I think, and I thought, well, what's going on? I said, what's, what's wrong? And he says, well, you should take your foot off, off the accelerator. Such a small car that <laughs> my foot was on his accelerator. So that was the start of our interview. <laughs> it wasn't very promising. <laughs> so, but it, it got better after that. So we went back to the plant and we talked. And yeah, it, uh, in the end, he said, you know, I'd like you to work with us. As previously mentioned, the first instrument that was Jeremy's design was the Pro Soloist. So we did a new Soloist, and this was on different concepts, and I was Totally the engineer of that. I, I designed all of that, 100%, absolutely. Through its very early employment of digital technology, the Pro Soloist was ahead of its time for 1972. Starting with an analog VCO, a ramp and five preset pulse waves that can be combined are generated at a very high frequency. This VCO runs into a digital closed loop error correction system that keeps the frequency precisely in place with an optimum settling time between frequency changes. This error detection system only covers a single octave range because the digital scanning keyboard then controls a series of digital dividers to give you four octaves within a musical range. Via the frequency to voltage converter, the divided down signal forces the error detection system back into action to correct the oscillator frequency, keeping it perfectly in tune in whatever octave you're in. So this essentially allows for continuous slewing across the keyboard. This keyboard also uses binary code to define both the octave and the specific note within that octave when a key is pressed. This means that like the oscillator, it's also both accurate and stable, especially when compared to the standard analog keyboard designs of the era. Although it's monophonic, Jeremy's digital scanning keyboard predated Oberheim and sequential circuits use of EMU Systems digital scanning keyboard by half a decade. And then further digital dividers to give you the pulse trains you needed to form the waveforms. And then they were combined just by resistive summers. So the whole keyboard was totally digital. And what we had was lots of different boards, one board for each function with an 8-bit input and a ribbon cable that tied them all together in parallel. 
And so that ended up at the switch bank. And so when you switched an instrument, you got the right code that went to all the modules and set them all up. You know, if you had 000001 for instrument number one, then out from that would pop 10010101111 or something to, to set the module up. So they were individual ROMs on each board. Uh, and that's how it all worked. And and it was, it was very successful and very stable, super stable, because of the digital electronics. Like the original soloist, the Pro Soloist had assignable aftertouch with threshold and sensitivity settings, which was achieved by using closed foam conductive rubber under the keys. It didn't matter where you compressed it, the change in resistance was about the same, so you could now press any key and, and, and you could use that as an effect. You could use it for changing pitch, or, or you could use it for adding wow, you know. Or you could use it for frequency modulation. You'd have a low frequency oscillator. You could add tremolo or vibrato, and you could switch those different things. The voicing of the pro soloist was done by Jeremy, but also included input from David Frederick, known professionally as David Fredericks, over beer and bananas in Jeremy's basement. Information that may cause some viewers to let out a comic wow. The pro soloist proved influential and became a path that several competing manufacturers subsequently walked down in the early 70s with these instruments intended to sit on top of an organ or Rhodes and be used for solo lines. The Moog Satellite, Mini Korg 700, Yamaha SY1 and 2, and the Roland SH1 and 2000 synths being comparable examples. It also became the lead instrument of choice for Tony Banks of Genesis for a time, as well as cropping up in the music of Billy Preston and David Bowie, amongst others. <laughs> The final version of this concept was the later Pro DGX. had been the first link to David Frederick, who was at that point a regional sales manager and concert artist for the Lowry Organ Company. David received a call from a friend who ran a music store who had taken in a 2600 to sell. He called me up one day and said, hey, he said, I've got this thing, I don't know, out of Boston. He said, it's, it's like, a, they call it a synthesizer. And he says, it's got holes in the cabinet. And he said, I don't know what the hell to do with it. And he said, why don't you come up and let's play with it. 
And I went up and I looked at it and I said, well, what is it? How do you make a call <laughs> with this thing? And anyway, to make a very long story short, um, he said, why don't you take it home and play with it? And I said, okay. So I took it home and uh, basically, I don't know. It's just, I just knew what to do. After getting the hang of this newfangled instrument, David's friend asked him to help him sell it by demonstrating it live at the store. So he called me up and he says, well, he says, let's do an in-store concert. I said, you're kidding. He said, no. I said, all right. So I brought it up there and uh, apparently Al Perlman uh, heard about it and he came down with a couple of people. So I started with the organ and the 2600. I was making trumpets. I was making trains pulling out of the station, uh, all kinds of sounds. Uh, and Al just was like beyond himself because he never heard it played live. And so he asked me to join the company. And that's when I joined Tonus at the time. David's other strength was in human engineering as he developed the patchbooks, overlays and manuals, as well as coming up with some subsequent instrument names. David used his contacts from the organ industry and started a team, initially including Bernie Clocko, Bill Wentz, Dan Hakala, John Shiken and Bruce McClendon. A little later came Bill Singer, Rick Parent, Paul Pittman, Dan Garrett, Ron Fennessy, and a 19-year-old Mike Brigida. Uh, and basically, I started de developing the sales team um, and grad guys from the organ industry because there was nobody from the synthesizer industry. Um, and I brought them in and I taught them how to demonstrate the 2600 um, and the soloist at the time and basically sent them out in the field. I uh, got thrown out of a few stores uh, because they didn't know what it was or anything else and says, get that crap out of here. You know, and a year later, they were begging us to take the line. The inspiration for some of the patches came from various places, such as patch number 53, sporadic heavy breathing. One day I was at my office and my phone rings and I pick it up and I'm saying hello and I hear this heavy breathing like... And I'm like, I said, Mike, I said, you got to get another hobby. <laughs> he was in he was in the lab and he created with uh, 2600, the 2600 actually breathing. It's, it's in the patch book, by the way. <laughs> and that's Mike Bridget's patch book. And patch number 74, the Wampus Monster. You know, so the sun's going down and we're saying, hey, you kids better come in the house because if you don't come in here right now, it's getting dark. The Wampus is going to get you. And a wampus was a half man, half frog. And see, that would come out after children, right? So I created this sound called the wampus. Now it's in your 2600 patch book. All you have to do is turn the reverb up, turn the lights out, and it will scare the living hell out of you. David's creativity around the demonstration of synthesizers in a performance setting led him to record bespoke records for the art products. did this blue plastic demo record uh, using the soloist and the 2600. And that was the first record. So we went to the first NAM show and it was again, a piece that you could hand out to everybody and then they could take it home and they could listen to it. And it was a full demonstration on the, the two products. It was designed for people to listen to it, to say, hey, this thing can play music. It's a musical instrument. Uh, that was the idea, was to seed the market and, and let that record be the salesman. But David also wanted to emphasize to musicians that synthesizers weren't just for use by studios and universities. They could be gigged with. The perfect opportunity to show this was at the NAM trade show. And I said, OK, what we're going to do is we're going to let the industry really hear what synthesizers could do. I got a hold of the hotel and I got a hold of the people in the bar and I paid off the band and told them to go home for the weekend. <laughs> they didn't have to work. And we put together uh, a variety of songs 
And I decided, well, we're going to make this so that they're going to remember us, not only besides the music. So it was called the Art Nam Jam. As you know, musicians, we jam. So what I did is I decided, okay, this is really cool. I went out and I bought uh, uh, quite a few cases of strawberry jam. And after the factory closed, myself and one of the engineers, I took the jam and put it in hot water, took the labels off, and I had labels printed up. I wish I had that today. And the label said Arp Nam Jam, and it was strawberry jam, <laughs> it doesn't matter. And then I put ingredients, and then I put, you know, uh, Mike and myself and Tom and, and Cleve, and then starring, and then I had the synthesizers listed. We put them on the tables, you know, in, in this, big, this big lounge that we had. Uh, and then I had napkins made and stirs made. Um, so I really laid it down so that when people came, it wasn't just listening to a bunch of guys playing some something new. It was an event, and we made it hard for somebody to get in. I mean, it was pretty interesting, and it's one of the funniest stories we tell was one of the things was Bob Moog and his sales manager snuck in the back, the back of the room you know, to hear us play live. Uh, a lot of very important people that came in to uh, hear us. Uh, and um, it was the first time it just blew the industry apart because they never heard synthesizers play like we made them play. And that was my whole marketing strategy was to be able to get all the music dealers, whether it was piano and organ or MI, um, to be able to say, wow, I can sell these things. It's a whole new market. The Arc Nam Jam was uh, a tremendous, tremendous hit. Realizing the appeal and potential of these more compact instruments, in 1972 from their new location at 320 Needham Street, Newton, ARP released a neat and cable-free monosynth for use on stage, the Odyssey. <laughs> being aware of the Odyssey when it first came out because the name was so compelling and it was so different than the other ones that were just models 2500 and 2600. So I remember having the discussions about that and some of the subsequent names. You know the 2600 still had a lot of flexibility because it had patch cords and so forth but the truth of the matter is uh, you could get 90 percent of the sounds that you wanted without any patch cords. And so I said, why don't we make a synthesizer that's specifically designed for the stage that has no patch cords? And, you know, it won't have the ultimate flexibility of being able anything connect anything to anything, but it'll have all the useful stuff, the things that you hear over and over and over again. And uh, so, uh, yeah, and that worked out really well. I mean, that was an incredibly popular stage instrument. We made thousands of them, you know. Far simpler to use and affordable enough to compete with Moog's Model D, the Odyssey went on to be one of ARP's biggest selling products. Although, perhaps surprisingly, it doesn't actually take top spot in that regard, as we'll see. David sketched out the electronics of what would become the Odyssey and arrived at a duophonic synth that has sawtooth and square waves available on its two oscillators, with the first oscillator able to run in low frequency mode. There's pulse width modulation, one dedicated LFO, two envelopes, sample and hold, oscillator sync, ring mod, FM, a resonant low pass filter and a non-resonant high pass filter, white and pink noise sources and on later models CV gate and trigger connectivity. You can also run external audio through it and control it with a foot switch and pedal. Plenty to get your hands on, but simple enough to understand quickly and crucially without the need for any patch cables. And where did the name come from? Um, I named it because it was an odyssey. It was an adventure of sound, you know, into the like the universe. It was something new that nobody ever explored before. And it's an odyssey, and that's why I named it the Odyssey. <laughs> As mentioned earlier, the duophony trick had been implemented as a modification to the 2600 and it was installed as standard on the Odyssey. When you uh, press two keys down at the same time, it, it changed the current going through the resistor ladder in the analog keyboard. 
And if you just take that voltage and add it to the lowest note, you get the higher note. It's pretty simple. I don't, I don't know why we didn't think of it originally, but you know, it was uh, once, once you see it, it was so obvious. There were numerous iterations of the Odyssey across three main models, and you'd have to be a tedious dork to list them all. So here we go. In 1972 came the Mark I Model 2800, which was white-faced and used a 4023 two-pole filter. Later units introduced a new black and gold colour scheme but were otherwise the same. This colour scheme continued into the Mark IIs through models 2810 to 2815. The Mark II models saw a new 4035 four-pole filter as well as CV gate and trigger connections that hadn't been included on the Mark I. From 1978 onwards, models 2820 to 2823 were the final Odysseys to be manufactured under the Mark III umbrella. This model introduced the Proportional Pitch Controller, or PPC. This was a section to the bottom left of the instrument that housed three pressure-sensitive pads that allowed different pitch modulations to be performed on the fly. You also find Mark IIs that have had this section retrofitted in place of the pitch wheel. The other significant electronics change were different oscillators and again a different filter. Under pressure from the aforementioned Moog patent, the 4035 found in the Mark II had to be changed to a new 4075 design for the Mark III. The 4075 actually had a miscalculation in its design, meaning that it could only reach around 12 kHz as opposed to the 35 kHz of the earlier incarnations. The result is that the instruments with this filter have a darker sound. The other upgrades were mainly cosmetic and introduced the then uniform orange and black colour scheme, a metal case with embedded PPC pads and a rather precarious looking keyboard design, although there is a specific reason for this. As synths were mainly monophonic and stacked for live performance, the cutaway design allowed players to key two synths at once and or get their hands between them more easily. April 73, went to ARP, bought Odyssey and Pro Soloist. So I got the first the white face in 73. It was very fast. Uh, to work with if you want to do a lot of you know different things in a solo and if you got a little out you, you could very easily see where you are and bring it back to the original sound that you started with where the 2600 you know throw in a couple of patch chords and at the, all of a sudden they bathe you in blue light things could get a little uh, <laughs> uh, interesting so yeah I think that contributed to its popularity in addition to its lower price. David Frederick developed point of purchase materials to make sure the Odyssey was accessible as possible to those confronted with it. How do you present a product line and products that people could relate to? Back then, as you know, it was organs. And how do you make music with these kind of instruments called synthesizers? Because some of the things that I did uh, in developing the Odyssey um, was using overlays so that you could put a cutout overlay on the Odyssey and get an immediate sound. That's what kind of propelled us, because nobody knew anything about subtractive synthesis back then, you know, let alone anything else. I and mean, it was just, it was new to everybody. The Odyssey combined this accessibility and portability with a powerful sound, and ARP knew it was important to get it into the hands of famous musicians so that their fans would want to buy them too. If Stevie Wonder had a hit on an ARP synthesizer, everybody would run out and buy ARPs. If uh, Keith Emerson had a big hit with a Moog, everybody would run out and buy Moogs. With this in mind, David moved away from the engineering role of his earlier years and began to chase down musicians and bands in order to show the world that the biggest stars played ARPs. That was an experience, you know, get up at nine o'clock at night, go to some recording studio and hope the band shows up by three in the morning and, and they weren't too stoned or drunk to see the piece of paper you were trying to get them to sign or run interference for the manager who says, no, 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 they're not going to sign anything, you know. For the artists, we didn't give any equipment away, which a lot of companies do. Um, they had to buy everything because we didn't want that taint on the brand. But we did have these uh, gold-plated uh, like credit cards that we would give the manager. And if you had one of those, you could walk into any music store in the world that carried ARP and exchange a dead or defective ARP for a new one right off the floor and then you know we would reimburse the dealer we'd give him a new synthesizer plus give him 500 bucks for his trouble 
The persistence of this approach paid off and the Odyssey was used by ABBA, Kraftwerk, Ultravox, Steely Dan, Jimmy Page, Deep Purple, Chick Corea, Tangerine Dream, George Duke, Van Gelis, John Fox, Jethro Tull, Devo and Herbie Hancock, amongst many others, as well as voicing the distinctive melody that appeared in the BBC Radiophonic Workshop's Doctor Who theme rearranged by Peter Howell. Having chased artists, David started having artists chase him. Yeah, and, you know, it got to the point where the sort of second-tier bands we used to get, you know, like, how do we get one of those, you know? I said, well, you're not famous enough, you know? When you're more famous, it can, and your name will do us more good, you'll get a gold card. <laughs> By contrast, Alan Perlman remained focused on the electronics rather than the rock stars and pop stars who were using them. I did not meet any rock stars, and there's a story behind this. And that is one of my father's co-workers, who had a kid around my age, was telling me how she had an autographed George Harrison something or other. Girls at 14 or 15 can be pretty demanding. And I said, how come I didn't get one of these? So next time he came back from Europe, I got a autographed 12-inch single Pete Townsend autographed it for me to Dino. And uh, when I asked my father, so what was he like? He says, well, I don't know. I s one of the salesmen went out and got it. <laughs> and that was him. You know, if he met someone because he was told to meet them, he would meet them. My mother said she met a beetle. I said, which one? She goes, I really don't remember. They, the, the pair of them were not starstruck. Uh, it, if Sabotnik came around or uh, Mahler was resurrected, maybe he would be starstruck, but it, it was not his cup of tea. So I did not get to meet the rock stars. Although perhaps that was a blessing in disguise, as musicians having your gold card and phone number wasn't always a good thing, as David found out when he got a call from an irate Steely Dan. Yeah, this, the Odyssey had apparently died in the middle of a recording session, and I get this call at like two in the morning. And there's this irate person on the phone, and he says, "I want to, I want you to hear this." And I hear, bang, 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 and it, then, he, then he, you know, he he says, "We just took this Odyssey, you know, it's some expletives around that, and we just put a railroad stake through it, and attached it to the wall of the studio." <laughs> And it was there years later. I went, happened to be in LA at the time, and I went by, and this Odyssey was still sticking there. <laughs> it was bad. <laughs> but impaled on a wall or not, the Odyssey can arguably lay claim to being one of the defining monosynths of the 1970s. And with an enduring legacy, it's re emerged in various forms in recent years that we'll discuss a little later. Tracking slightly, in 1973, Art went public and sold stock to raise the funds needed to move the company forward. My brother worked on Wall Street in the early 70s, and uh, Art went public, I think when they went public in 70, uh, 73, and so he bought a few hundred shares, May 22nd, 1973. Uh, there it is. You, you want to buy some stock? <laughs> <laughs> That same year, a then 24-year-old Roger Powell released his debut LP, Cosmic Furnace, on Atlantic Records. 
The entirely instrumental album made heavy and skillful use of ARP synthesizers, and this wasn't a coincidence, as Roger had worked as an applications engineer for ARP in the early Tonus days and had recorded some of ARP's demonstration discs with David Frederick, including an entire walkthrough specifically for the Odyssey. Roger's talent led to his recruitment for Todd Rundgren's band Utopia shortly after in 1975, and he also had a long career as a composer, performer, programmer and columnist for publications such as Keyboard Magazine. An amusing story involving Roger started in 1971 when a then 16-year-old Dana Countryman posed as Dr. Dana Countryman, pretending to be the owner of a recording studio. He received a reply from Roger describing Tonus products and services along with a poster of the Blue Marvin 2600. When a thread about this story was posted on Synthesizers.com in 2004, Powell saw it and responded by asking if Dr. Countryman was still interested in ARP's fine units and that he was still patiently awaiting his response. Interestingly, this letter also references the Series 4000 encapsulated modules that ARP was selling at the time. These were the same modules used in the 2600 sold separately to clients like Bell Laboratories. For the next part of the ARP story, we need to go to uh, Holland. Dutch organ manufacturer Eminent BV had been busy inventing the 310 unique home organ. This was no ordinary organ, however, as the instrument had a trick up its sleeve, a string ensemble synthesizer section. Combining the usual divide-down technology with bucket brigade delays and an emulation of the Leslie speaker called the Orbitone, the 310 produced a distinctive and lush sound that was immortalised by Jean-Michel Jarre on his seminal Oxygen and Equinox albums where he ran his 310 through a small stone phaser to heighten this effect. Here we have another flagship eminent organ from that era that also includes the string synthesizer. The 2000 Grand Theatre organ performed by one-time eminent demonstrator John Mann. to the Frankfurt Messe and uh, I was walking around and uh, just checking out seeing who's got what and I walked up to this organ uh, that was out of one of the displays and I started playing it and I'm like wow these strings are phenomenal so I went and I ended up asking a few people to say well you know this is a Selena strings and we're licensed to put it on organs I got a hold of the managing director of Eminent which was the company I, I had a long talk with him, and after a lot of negotiations, I convinced them to take the strings section, electronics, out of the that section of the organ and put it in a box. And so we ended up, the first ones came over, and it was the ARP Ensemble. And that's what I called it. <clears throat> we had a very good uh, professional relationship with them. And that was, uh, that was great because it helped us both.
Selena was a hit and wound up on David Bowie's Low, Gary Wright's Dreamweaver and Pink Floyd's Shine On You Crazy Diamond amongst many others. The relationship worked both ways as ARP gave eminent circuit boards from their 1975 Explorer monosynth for use in the Selena string synthesizer, as well as their C112S and C117S organs. Here we have Josh from Belgian synth pop band Munatix playing the ARP eminent hybrid Selena string synthesizer. Although the Selena is one of the most famous string synthesizers and most popular, it wasn't the first. Now I'm going to discard the Hammond Nova Chord from 1938 because it was not built specifically as a string emulator and at 225 kilograms it was neither portable either. The first lightweight, dedicated string synthesizer that employed an ensemble effect was designed and built by British composer and performer Ken Freeman. And in fact, one of his prototypes had been at the very same Frankfurt Messe the year before the Selena was launched. Now that's not to say that manufacturers like Eminent copied his design because they didn't. They found their own ways to create their own instruments and unfortunately for Ken, both Eminent and Krumar had got their offerings out before he'd secured formal production of his and as a result sometimes his contribution has been overlooked. A couple of lesser known products from this era are the ARP Little Brother, which was a monophonic expander module to connect with other ARP synths, and also a project led by Tom Piggott called the ARP Modular Synthesizer Lab, also known as the MSL and sometimes referred to as the learning modules. Still with an eye on the educational establishments that had purchased earlier 2500 and 2600 models, the MSL was built of separate battery powered modules that could be connected together as the building blocks of an analog synth. Perlman, Friend and Piggott had written a book titled Learning Music with Synthesizers in 1974 and there was an accompanying workbook made for the Modular Synthesizer Lab too, along with example compositions. Don Muro briefly became a demonstrator for the MSL and then later went on to set up his own company and purchase the inventory from ARP. So my dad and I talked it over and we actually signed a contract in June 14th, 1980, MSL contract for $25,000. We got uh, all existing inventory, uh, 10 actually educational books. Five had already been illustrated, five were still in draft. And we figured it out, you know, the, the retail price on the existing inventory that I had, and I can't find the actual numbers, but I know it was about $89,000 retail. Now, did we sell all of it? No, but we, you know, we certainly didn't lose any money. We made something, you know. Uh, but it, was, it, it wasn't a home run financially. And uh, several years later, uh, after the whole thing had passed, I basically gave my extra modules to my tech at the time. And those modules go for like $300, $400 a piece now. In 1975 came ARP's highest selling instrument. We were messing around the lab one day and, and basically um, I had this idea about taking the output and running it through an odyssey and let's see what we could do with the filters and stuff so i asked one of the techs to come in and, and can you disconnect the phasers uh the circuitry so that it would just be a straight sound and they said yeah sure I said, all right so he got in the back and disconnected them and i took the output and ran it through the odyssey and and adjusted everything and i had these really cool horns so i said all right this is cool so then i got a hold of eminent and i said to them hey <laughs> Can we put a switch in here? I said, so we can have the phases on and off. I said, and then we can run it through the Odyssey. And that was the forerunner of the Omni. The Omni was a relatively simple and accessible string synthesizer, and you've almost certainly heard it as it was used in the music of Joy Division, New Order, The Cars, Japan, Modern English, ELO, and Journey, amongst others. Building on from the earlier Selena concept, the Omni had separate string, synth and bass sounds that could be simultaneously combined with a chorus phaser circuit, meaning that the Omni was able to produce a lush and swirling sound.
There was a sequel, the Omni 2, in 1978 that brought with it several improvements, including separate outputs for the different sounds, as well as a change of clothing. Also, in 1975, ARP introduced a cut-down version of the Odyssey. As you know, musicians call, whether they're, it's a guitar or whether it's a saxophone, or whatever, they call their instrument their axe. That's the phrase. So, because this was a solo instrument, kind of like that, I decided to call it an axe. This is my axe. <laughs> and that's how I came up with the idea for that. The axe had one oscillator, one LFO, one filter and one envelope. Simple. Like many other art products, there was a later black and orange version of it with a change of filter and the addition of PPC switches. The Axe saw some success as a lead synth amongst keyboard players. Expanding their portfolio in 1976, Art put out an analogue sequencer using their trademark sliders, and I'll let Ruben walk you through it. The design feature of ARP's sequencer was the inbuilt voltage quantizer. This clever little invention divided the voltage in 12 and the slider can jump between the steps. The same year, businessman Joseph Mancuso joined ARP as a director. His suggestions on pricing and order structuring further boosted ARP's cash flow. From a people standpoint, it had a sales team that took the bar and raised it so high that there'll never be another one like it. They were not pressured. They were not, you got to. They were the nicest, most warmest individuals that believed in synthesizers. And they were all players. Every salesman could play. Um, when they went into various stores, all they had to do was sit down and play, talk to the management. This is what we can do. Da, 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 da. Personality wise, let's go out for beer. Well, that's why for the first couple of years we were so successful. David Frederick had been busy pushing ARP out to the world, coming up with as many ideas as possible to grab people's attention. In in the trade magazine, sometimes I put an ad in and I'd have it upside down, so that the people are going through the magazine. It's just like, wait a minute, and they had to turn it over because it's natural curiosity. But I got them to read my ad. <laughs> you know. The live shows continue to be a big part of how ARP instruments were demonstrated, and David travelled the world getting the word out. At a demonstration in Japan, this led to a special effect that was a bit too realistic. All right, here we go. Ten, nine, louder, eight, seven, six, five, four. And, you know, three, two, one, you know, lift off. And I'm hitting the, you know, the white noise generator and the whole thing. And, and the whole place starts shaking. I'm like, oh, this is really cool because I had earthquake speakers, you know. 
and the chandeliers were shaking and everything else. And like, oh, this is really cool. <laughs> Welcome to find out it was an earthquake. <laughs> Following successful sales from instruments like the Odyssey, String Ensemble and Omni, ARP turned over $7 million in 1977, had around 40% of the market and had moved to a new premises at 45 Hartwell Avenue, Lexington. ARP's successes had been hard fought as earning money from a fledgling market had not been easy. You know, it would be, I'd be on a bench and I'd be soldering contacts and the soloist or the pro soloist, and we'd have to try to put the, that and the Odyssey together uh, and hurry up before the end of the month. And then we would put the finished product on the dock. It would be considered a receivable so we could borrow money from the bank to make payroll. David Frederick left ARP in the mid 70s and joined Octave Electronics for a time and has stayed in the industry as a marketing and product development specialist to this very day. And if you want to bring the Wampus Monster back to life, you can even pick up the David Frederick signature patch book. Back to 1976, you might assume that the share of the market ARP had achieved by this time meant that they were a big company. But bear in mind that the 70s synthesizer market was never massive, so even ARP's highest selling instruments only ever shifted a few thousand units, and at its peak there were around 200 employees. It was a risky business as an investment in just one product that didn't sell could well prove difficult to recover from. People thought I had a much more glamorous life than I did. People would say, oh, you're from your father's ARP, you must have lots of money and things like that. And it came with sort of a, a presumption that I was living this high life. And I was really living pretty much a normal life of a kid with the exception of going to, you know, Europe or, or California or someplace once a year because we would, again, mix the family holiday with, with a trade show and things like that. In 1976, two parallel projects had been started in order to develop what they considered was the way to go. A polyphonic synthesizer with a digital keyboard and a sister guitar synthesizer. The latter was something that was first done by Bob Easton of 360 Systems and other manufacturers began to look into their own technology. And it seemed logical given the number of guitarists there were and how much more accessible synthesizers had become to stage performance throughout the 70s. Well, you know, I mean, guitar players were always saying, how can I make the same sounds that my keyboard player is making? And uh, there were a lot more guitar players than there were keyboard players in the world. And so we figured, wow, if we could make this work, you know, this might be a whole new market. And I can remember trying to find what the heck kind of connector can I use? You know, you can't use a standard guitar plug because you got six separate signals. And I, I, you know, we scoured the world for some kind of connector that would allow you to take six separate signals with coax on each one so they didn't interfere with each other. The guitar side of the project started out with the ambition that the six strings could control six separate synthesizers in one box, and it was dubbed the Centaur 6. You know, you were basically building special purpose processors out of discrete logic chips, you know, OR gates, AND gates, flip-flops, you know, that kind of stuff. And so it was expensive. It probably would have cost 15 or 20,000 bucks if we had had to bring it to market because it had a lot of gear in it. Well, we made one. I mean, we made a Centaur 6 and it, it actually worked better than the Avatar and then the Avatar because, you, you know, if you only have one string per synthesizer, you don't have this problem of trying to figure out what to do with chords because you play a chord, you get six notes coming out of six different synthesizers. Um, <clears throat> and so it actually would have been easier to build and it would have worked better than the Avatar. but. It was just like hugely expensive. One of the salesmen, Rick Parent, suggested his old guitar teacher, Bill Singer, as not only a guitar specialist, but somebody who had no background with synthesizers, as was their intended end user. One of the rare photos of the Centaur 6 features Bill sat in front of it, guitar in hand. The picture that you're talking about was the P. Townsend studio in London. And we had brought the thing over there um, to show Pete. And um, when we got there, the damn thing wasn't working. So Dave Friend, uh, with many phone calls, finally got the thing to, to work, and we invited press and various rock artists uh, of the time to the studio. And um, there is, I believe I still have a picture of Big Jim Sullivan playing it. The thing was probably around, oh, five feet wide. It's huge, huge. Sound-wise, oh, my God. 
I am telling you, it was the coolest thing you've ever heard. And I mean, people were blown away, absolutely blown away by it. Um, but looking at it from uh, a merchandising standpoint, it wasn't viable. So what happened to the Centaur 6? And are the stories of it continually breaking down true? No, it, it never kept breaking down. It broke down once um, for, uh, for the Pete's demo, and it was never shown again after that. It was a one-time shot. Went back to the factory, and all the circuit boards were taken out, and things stood in the corner back in engineering. A diary entry, uh, May 25th, 76, Bill Wentz came over, who was one of the um, reps for ARP, and I, I knew a, a bunch of them because I was traveling a lot, so... We said, talked about the Omni uh, mixer, the ARP no-noise mixer, I guess that had to have been, and the uh, and guitar synth. So this was May 25th, 76. Work had also begun on a simpler monophonic guitar synth using the existing electronics of the Odyssey, the ARP Avatar. An early print ad announces both the Centaur 6 and the Avatar, stating that the former is the world's first polyphonic guitar synthesizer, already acclaimed by top professionals as the ultimate black box, and the latter is uniting synthesizer and guitar to become the most powerful musical force of the 70s, 80s, and 90s. The prototype was that we tried some different things on it. Um, one of the things that we added was a switch that was octave up, octave down, a touch responsive thing that we had tried, which was iffy. It was, you know, at best. It, it never made it to uh, the actual production line. The result was two sizes of hexaphonic pickup that attached to either narrower string spaced Gibson style guitars or wider string spaced fenders. The pickups are different than a normal guitar pickup because there's essentially six pickups in one with each individual string signal isolated. Developed by Ron Hogue. Ron Hogue was uh, the inventor of the light pickup. So, how did it work? In a nutshell, the avatar counts the number of cycles of a very fast clock during each cycle of an incoming note, which measures the period of the note. The number of clock cycles counted is transferred into a digital memory location or register. The value in the register is used to divide down a second clock and this creates a square wave that can be converted from a frequency to a control voltage, which in turn is directed to the synth's oscillators to sound a note that matches the one you played on your guitar. The wave shape created by a guitar itself was too complex to be used directly, which is why the conversion to a square wave was necessary. So what that means is that for the synthesizer to work, you have to have one cycle of a note for it to identify what that note is. Well, that's a delay of uh, some milliseconds when you're down on your low E. There were workarounds. You played everything on Octifier. <laughs> And also the player had to develop a very clean picking style in order for the avatar to be able to extract the intended note. To assist with the isolation, the avatar has activation switches for individual strings so that only pitches from those chosen by the user are fed into the multiplexer. This then allows for some creative possibilities as a guitarist can run polyphonic parts with the straight signal of the guitar and select one string to run through the synth simultaneously. The first demo was the scariest. Now if you can imagine being on a stage and in front of you, Bob Moog, Alan Perlman, Tom Oberhard, Chet Atkins, the folks from Yamaha. The demo opened with uh, me playing a very clean hexaphonic sound in stereo. Uh, I'd set the touch responsiveness so that if I plucked a little harder, this huge boomy bang came out. When the synthesizer came, I swear to God, the looks on their faces was just priceless. It was absolutely amazing for them to hear this boom, 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 all the nasty ass synthesizer tones coming into the guitar. At the end of uh, NAM, guitar player um, did uh, a piece uh, on synthesizers and they called um, the avatar the best demonstrated instrument they'd ever heard um, as far as the synthesizer went. That was how I got in there and that was my first demo. I never could get Jet to try it though. <laughs> there is also another bonus effect on the avatar, which is hex fuzz. This takes the individual signals from the six strings and sends them through six isolated fuzz circuits and then sums them back together. So this is a fuzz effect, but without any crosstalk between the strings as you would get with a standard pickup. For this reason, it was nicknamed the clean fuzz. As with the standard hex pickup sound, the hex fuzz can also be combined with the synth sound if so desired. And with the synth itself, which is for all intents and purposes a Mark III Odyssey, a range of the usual analog effects and sounds can be created using things like sample and hold, ring modulation, filtering, cross mod and attenuation. 
Via the foot switches and pedal, there is control of portamento, filter cutoff, and like the Roland GR500, infinite sustain. So this new world of exciting sonic possibilities captured the imagination of guitarists, right? You spend so much time in getting your sound out of your gear that anything else is just not going to happen. So when you have an instrument like the Avatar that has thousands and thousands and thousands of sounds, it plays their mind. They just can't grasp the whole thing. It worked well enough for some people, but not well enough for the for the broad market, it, it fell short of, uh, you know, what what you would really like it to be able to do. But, you know, for ARP, it was just, it was uh, too much of a technical stretch for what was available at the time. You really needed digital signal processing. A good shot at the beginning. And of course, Roland came out with this CR series. I have a Roland too. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Kakahashi. Roland, press the button, press the button, press the button. Make sense? Unfortunately, with poor sales, production was stopped with only a few hundred avatars having been made. The project left art with a financial loss that played a part in the company's eventual closure. One person who did purchase an avatar, in fact two avatars, was composer and sound designer and one-time ARP salesman Alan Howarth, who used them with John Carpenter on the iconic Escape from New York soundtrack, amongst others. In fact, when I spoke to Alan in early 2019, he still has one in his studio. If you look hard enough, it also had a few other fleeting uses. But in terms of big famous avatar riffs played from a guitar, there aren't really any, and it has found more favour in recent years as a synth module controlled by standard CV gate and trigger. Whilst the CentOS 6 concept at least saw the light of day as the avatar, the tandem polysynth project had to be abandoned entirely. But it was, you know, we had the same block of six synthesizers or something like that that we had built for the Centaur and we put a digital keyboard on the front of it and uh, it also didn't make it to market. Instead, a new polyphonic project was started and the resulting release in 1978 was the ARP Quadra. This curious microprocessor controlled instrument combined four different sections, monophonic bass, duophonic lead, polyphonic string and polyphonic synth sounds that used divide down circuits. It was multi-tumbral and had independent outputs for each section as well as independent CV gate control of both bass and lead sounds. It also had a comprehensive phase shifter and an onboard sequencer. It had some star users such as Genesis, Pink Floyd and Weather Report. The, the right people playing it, it really sounded great. I mean it sounded like 50 instruments all at once. But it was, it was basically a bunch of existing technology thrown together in one box. So we got away from, you know, actually routing analog signals through, through physical switches and started to use digital switches that actually the, the audio signals were switched through solid state switches, not through mechanical switches. Yeah, it sold fairly well. I mean, it was on the expensive side, but it was, uh, it did pretty well and uh, kind of took over from the string synthesizer because it had a string synthesizer in it as well as a bunch of other stuff. And uh, so, it, yeah, it was a pretty good seller, as I recall. 
The Quadra was released in 1978, and that same year a new and game-changing instrument was launched that brought together the emerging technologies of patch memory and a digital scanning keyboard that allowed full articulation of each of the voices. Once the Prava came out, you know, that's where my head was going, and I think everybody else's obviously. But once, once the OBX came out uh, with eight voices, that's it. Where do I sign? You know, here's the check, I'll take it. The polyphonic thing with ARP kind of faded out once the Prophet and the Orion polyphonics came in. That said, the Quadra does have its fans, and again, Alan Howard and John Carpenter used one on the scores for Escape from New York and the Halloween sequels. Its sound has done a lot better with age, and thankfully for us, there are still a few running that we can enjoy 40 years later. By the early 80s, there were major shifts in terms of both competition and technology. There were digital synthesizers and samplers such as the Yamaha GS1, New England Digital Synclavier, Fairlight CMI and EMU emulator models. There were digital sequencers such as the Oberheim DS2, Sequential Circuits Model 800 and Roland MC8, and there were sample-based drum machines such as the Lin LM1 and Oberheim DMX. The digital revolution was well and truly in motion and the way electronics were being manufactured, particularly in Japan, was changing the landscape dramatically. But, you know, the writing was on the wall. I mean, the, the Japanese companies, Yamaha and Korg and so forth, they had such vertically integrated manufacturing capabilities. I mean, we, had, we couldn't make our own keyboards. We weren't going to get into the, in, the business of doing injection molded plastic or anything like that. And, you know, they could manufacture a synthesizer for what we were paying to buy a keyboard. I remember going to Japan and the Yamaha guys brought me into their lab and they had every single art, you know, sort of taken apart on the workbenches. They were very proud of the fact that, you know, they were copying every single detail. And uh, they even went to the trouble of taking some of the potted modules, like the VCOs and stuff, and grinding them down, you know, a tenth of a millimeter at a time, taking a picture and reconstructing what was inside them by grinding them down. You know, oh, Mr. Friend, you know, you're such a great inventor and, you know, ARP is such a great company and everything else. And to show you how much we admire everything you've done, take a look at our lab. <laughs> you know, it just looked like an ARP graveyard. <laughs> David left ARP in 1979 and set up his first software company. Even so, ARP's earlier 2600 was still in demand from musicians and was still in production at this point. I remember dating a musician in college who somehow talked me into having my father lend them um, an instrument, and I don't remember what it was, I believe it was a 2600. And of course, what happens, you know, the the father takes the instrument back when he needs to bring it back and, and the boyfriend leaves <laughs> right after that. And I, well, I'm never telling anybody who my father is ever again. <laughs> uh, so it, the, the identity that I had with being the daughter of, of Alan R. Perlman fluctuated as far as sometimes I didn't want to be identified. I have, of course, a different outlook about that completely now. You know, when you're, when you're gaining your own sense of self, it, it, it could be quite daunting. As the 70s came to a close, Art released 16 voice and four voice electric pianos aimed at home users, with the voices referring to the number of presets rather than the polyphony available, as they were both fully polyphonic. Unfortunately, the mylar used in the button design would set if it got hot, rendering the instrument unusable. The pianos began coming back for repair as quickly as they went out, the last thing Art needed. One final monosynth, the Solus, was released in 1980. Whilst the Solus is essentially another Odyssey variant, it's worth noting as during its production, regional technical rep Timothy Smith suggested a mod to the 4075 filter that finally rectified the issue of limited high-end response that had been present on the four pole-based designs for a couple of years. Later on, ARP also acquired the Mutron line of effects pedals, including the famous Biphase, 
and they rebadged the Italian Seal Orchestra as the ARP Quartet for the US. Phil Dodds was well aware of the direction things were going and continued to build upon ARP's earlier experiments with digital technology. He led a team to develop a whopping 16-voice polysynth with powerful modulation, digital control and a computer interface, the ARP Chroma. At this time, inspired by Hal Alice's work at Bell Labs, a couple of ARP engineers started working on a second digital synth intended to be controlled by an LSI-11 microcomputer. But it only got as far as two boards covered with TTL logic chips and was never finished. And sadly, the game was up for ARP by the spring of 1981 and the company went into liquidation. What would happen is the bank would finance uh, inventory that went out to dealers, but they wouldn't get paid until the instruments were sold. So if there was too much product in the field that was not selling, the bank's underwater. It's very easy to get overextended if the market dives down. You, you, you just get stuck. Uh, you, get that, you combine that with a market change, which was happening in the, in the shift to you know, things like Yamaha and so forth. Uh, all of that uh, compounded and put the company into Chapter 11. And the bank became uncomfortable and asked for there to be a uh, trustee. He came in and took over the company and um, fired most of the management, including Alan. Basically, the company went into liquidation. Despite everything that was going on, Dodds honoured an order made by Don Muro for 10 keyboards for the modular synthesizer lab, which must have been one of the last things manufactured by ARP. I'm sure this is one of the last things going out of ARP. The date is uh, June 19th, 1981, uh, uh, 10 MSL keyboards. And right on the invoice, it says, pay directly to First National Bank of Boston, Post Office Box 1965. So they were already... Uh, pretty near the end at that point. But he honored us, he gave us those keyboards, and then uh, the ship went down. So uh, I would say the Avatar and the, uh, the electric piano were the uh, uh, failed products, but lots of companies have failed products and they're able to survive it. We didn't. We just didn't have the wherewithal. I saw it coming and I didn't know what we could do about it. Dodds and his team managed to take the Chroma project with them to CBS Musical Instruments and it was resurrected as the Rhodes Chroma in 1982. The company had shut down, lights off, I'm working alone in the building for months on the phone trying to pitch this and then going down to New York to BlackRock where CBS was. So they strike the deal, which is an asset deal, and they say, okay, you, the deal is contingent upon your rehiring your entire team. You know, I remember coming back from New York saying, how on earth can I do that? Everybody's gone, and, and how can I tell them to, to quit where they just started working or to quit looking and, you know, come back and reconstitute the R&D team? And we pulled, pulled that team together. That shows you the strength. So they all, we all came back together into a new facility, started from scratch, picked up all our work, and carried it to completion. You're talking about a, a microprocessor-based product that was you know, state-of-the-art, groundbreaking in many ways. It, you know, the first instrument that had a computer port to a PC, IBM PC and an Apple II, and a, and a predecessor to MIDI, and had all of the MIDI functionality, but before MIDI was, was, was formalized. And it was being built side-by-side side with two amps in Fullerton. And the bulk of the factory was guitar manufacturing. And none of these are particularly high-tech compared to what we were doing.
The Chroma was then developed into the Chroma Polaris, which drifts beyond what could be considered an ARP synthesizer, as this was 1984 and a full three years after ARP had closed down. Perhaps with the benefit of hindsight they could have survived longer, but to be fair to ARP, with a small, high-risk and ever-changing market, coupled with strong competition from Japanese manufacturers, sequential circuits, Oberheim, Lin Electronics and Moog had all gone under or been bought and repurposed by the mid-80s, so perhaps it was something of an inevitability. But I guess we'll never know for sure. The tsunami from Japan was a just hard competition. And then the, the DX7, you know, goodbye. <laughs> That was it. I mean, I, I would do, late, in the late 80s, I would do clinics for Korg. You know, with the DX7 out, you go into these music stores up in New England or down south. And people had traded in mini mogs. You could buy them for 150 bucks. <laughs> it's just incredible how, how this tide changed. I mean, ultimately, you know, the market spoke and vindicated us. But we, the te we were just ahead of the technology. And what we were trying to do just was impossible at the time. And the irony is, is when I finally decided I was going to play some keyboards in a band, at that point I wanted to play a piano, not a synthesizer. And um, my dad ended up getting me a Roland. What we do know is that interest in ARP's creations didn't end when the doors closed in 1981. In fact, if anything, it's slowly grown over the decades since. ARP's instruments have been emulated and recreated in software and cloned in hardware. In fact, three and a half decades later, the Odyssey was officially re-released by Korg, with input from none other than David Friend in 2015. Right here under my desk. <laughs> so, you know, this thing arrives in the mail, and there it is. <laughs> so, it was like 30 years had just passed by in a minute, you know. And uh, so very funny. And uh, it's great to know that something you did 30 years ago is still the subject of fascination for, you know, young musicians. Alan had also been involved in recreations of ARP's instruments in more recent years when he consulted on the Time Warp 2600 developed by Way Out Wear in 2006. Turns out the 2600 did... did, did quite well for the company and I understand that the 2600s still have a good reputation and uh, it's very gratifying uh, to know that uh, you know, a lot of musicians have uh, used it and well it's, it's been very uh, pleasant uh, knowing that I really did make some contributions. <laughs> Never made any money at it, but still. <laughs> Following the closure of ARP, Alan Perlman moved into computing and set up Selva Systems with one of his former employees, Bruce Chikaulis. Bruce was also a co-founder of Kurzweil and Alan was a software consultant for them in the mid-80s. They also hired several other ex-ARP people and Perlman would later be employed by Phil Dodds at Visage working on projects such as interactive laser discs. My father was one of the biggest influences of my life not just because of what he created via these wonderful inventions, but because of the type of person he was. He mentored me, he mentored strangers, and he mentored anyone that came into his view that he, he felt was really interested in, in furthering their education and knowledge of something. He was my Google. I like to say that a lot. When I had a question about anything in the universe, I would bring it to him at dinner time, and he seemed to always have some kind of answer. He had this, uh, you know, restless spirit, and uh, kept that right to the end. And he was always just full of ideas. And uh, a wonderful guy, nice man. I, he, he sorely missed. In the months following Alan's passing, the Alan R. Perlman Foundation was formed. This would be perpetuating one of his personal visions, and that was to pass it on. He had taught me very early on that it is the responsibility of one generation to pave the way for the generation uh, after them. And he very, very much believed in it. He felt that it was you know, a moral obligation to 
enhance people's lives, younger people's lives, people that needed a, a leg up, whether it was for age or for opportunity. The plans for the foundation involve working with educational institutions, such as Berkeley College of Music, Brown University, Tufts University, and we wish to both have scholarships for students that would like to be able to go to these colleges and would not be able to afford to do so otherwise, and also hopefully get artists in residencies, so sponsor some uh, an artist to come in for a semester or two work on electronic music projects, for instance. In late 2019, the door to an art-related secret was left ajar. And the very good news is actually uh, Korg is going to release uh, a real clone of the ARP 2600 beginning of next year. This is something that's going to be a, a, a big release for, in, for 2020 in terms of electronic instruments. The 2600 reissue sold out almost immediately and fittingly won Best in Show at NAMM 2020 on the 50th anniversary of the first ARP appearance at the famous trade show. Back in 1982, only a year after ARP folded, Roger Powell wrote this rather prophetic statement about his old employer in an article in Keyboard magazine. I remember those halcyon days at art with fondness and regret that the mark is no longer with us. Certainly the instruments will continue to be used to make wonderful music, even if the company will never make new ones. If you have an old 2600 or Odyssey, it could become a collector's item someday.